Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. First Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8. Now, to give you a preamble, to help you go back to understand the setting of First Kings chapter 8 and slightly before that, Solomon has had 13 years of building his own house and palace and everything that is necessary. And then he gets into the place of building the house of God, which takes him seven years for completion. He builds the temple with all the instruments, the elements that were handed over from his father David, and many more other things from his own. He sacrifices big to God. And then before we know that, then the sacred things are supposed to be moved into the temple, including the Ark of the Covenant. And of course it is moved, and the presence of God is there. The priests are unable to withstand the glory of God. In that moment, the anointing of God is so present for the people. And we will now get to the verses 14 where our major reading and teaching is going to be done. Of course, it's up to the thickness of the cloud of glory filling the house of worship. The Ark of the Covenant is brought into the temple. And then the king, Solomon, turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood up because they honored the blessing of the king. And he said... Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth and to David my father, and has with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day I brought forth my children, or my people, Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build an house, that my name might be therein. But, 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 I chose David to be over my people, Israel. And it was in the heart of David, my father, Solomon says, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord God said unto David, my father, whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that cometh forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house, and to my name. Praise God. Let me begin from there. We see an experience in time history where Solomon has built the temple, and he is celebrating and grateful to Almighty God for giving him the opportunity to fulfill what the Lord had spoken. All right? But I love how these words are arranged, and I believe divinely ordered. That when the Lord brings the children of Israel from captivity, the Bible says God never designated any area or place or ever made any request for them to build a temple, a place of worship and congregation for him. But the Bible says that God chose David. God chose a man. All right? God chose a man. And when he chose a man, it was built in the heart of that man to build a temple for God. And when it was so, then later we see that God tells this man that it's not for you to build this even though it is good to be in your heart. God was not against the building of the temple. But he says that your son after shall build that temple. I think there's a very important narrative there that I believe that the church has missed so greatly, the body of Christ has missed so greatly. People sort of overlook 
God's mind and purposes, touching the message, his glory, his mandate, the assignment on earth. And this is it. It's not that God did not have an idea or a mind to have a central place for his people to congregate, to come together for fellowship with him. Oh, it was in his heart too, as God. That is why he says it was good that David thought about it. Okay? But God tells you that he never gave it as an instruction and a command to the children of Israel to do it because that is not what came first to God. I want you to understand this. Some people have a very deluded understanding of God. Okay? And this is what they think. Probably that when God's idea about the church comes, he first thinks about the magnificence of the buildings. He looks at the beauty of gold and silver. He looks at the cameras that are going to be there. He looks at the stage that is going to be built. He looks at the, you know, the parking lots that are going to be built in these churches. He looks at how much land that the churches are going to have. And then he sees how beautiful a building is. And then he says, aha, now I'm going to build my church. Now I'm going to establish my rule. The kingdom of God is not the kingdom of this world. Of course, the Bible says God has pleasure in the beauty of his temple. He pleasures in it, right? He pleasures in the beauty of his temple. He's a God of beauty. Within him there is beauty, all right? But to God... This beautification, this building, does not come first. You shouldn't miss the order here. All right? God does not think that, I think this is a third world country. I need to build a great city out of this third world country so my people walk out of poverty. Of course, God celebrates beauty. He celebrates clean cities. He celebrates beautiful buildings. All of that is his idea. Wisdom, Sophia is the mother of all witty inventions and innovations. Nothing is built by man in ardent skill that is not imbued by God in the man's spirit. So God celebrates that. But God, in his idea, does not think, okay, let me build the most beautiful city in the world. That's not what he thinks. That's secondary, okay? If God is to raise a people, his idea is a man. His idea is always a man, all right? So when the children of Israel come from bondage, they have come to become something. Moses, you know, is trying to get guys who have been under bondage for about 400 years. They don't know what it means to be free. They do not know what it means to be a nation. Every idea of being a nation is Egyptian mythology. And Egyptian mythology is so off the mind and idea of God's sovereign purpose and plan of building a nation. Unfortunately, the systems of this world have borrowed Egyptian myths, like the Roman systems, all right? Rome, the empire, was built on Egyptian mythology, okay? And, of course, Greek mythology and philosophies and Persian Zoroastrian and all these other foundations. And these are not things that will stand for a time. They've been proved to fail. Rome failed. Rome disappeared out of the face of the earth, the empire. Okay, nobody speaks Latin. Some people need to even be told that there was an empire that existed called Rome, but in the time of Roman Empire, nobody existed that there would ever be anything bigger than it. It had all the money, it had all the armies, it had all the buildings. I mean, if you look at people like Constantine the Emperor in 350 AD when he takes over Rome, he feels that even the glory in Rome is not just enough to justify his place and position as an emperor. He goes to Constantinople, and then he builds another beautiful city, another beautiful city, you know. They built things that were so amazing that all the art and craft was there, all right? But where is it now, okay? How does Constantinople look like now? Does it still remind men of what Constantine built or many things have changed and generations have come in the same place, present day Turkey, and some are building things and some don't even need to know, are not even connected with the old order, 
Okay, the faith in Constantinople then is not the faith celebrated now in Turkey. Things have changed. Generations have come and gone. Okay? Generations are not remembered by buildings. Okay? Movements are not remembered by cathedrals. Generations of movements and revival movements and great flames and awakenings are not remembered by the physical things that we build, notwithstanding that God is not against that because it brings social order and helps uh, establish sort of an institution to keep the flame and keep men in a certain pattern and not against the building of great cathedrals or great buildings. We build and I wish that all ministers the same have opportunities to build things that bring glory to God. But those are not the things that survive for generations because God's idea is a man. Okay? So you see, when God thinks of what he wants to build, when God thinks of the temple, you know, the place that his people have to come together to, he does not mandate Israel to do it. He doesn't call any Israelite to tell him, look, I want you to do ABC. No. The Bible says I never spoke to any of them or never chose a city for them to build me a temple. He says, but I chose David to be over my people. All right? And when he chose David to be over his people, his idea is I will get a man, and in that man's heart, I will put the idea that I need to build on the earth. Hallelujah, glory to God. I will get a man, and in that man, I will establish the vision that I have on the earth. All the things that you see, and there are visions under this man David. I'm not saying that because, you know, David built a city and all this, that there was no other hand of other people. There was an effort of other people. There was a contribution of certain individuals that history might not write about. But all of these were connected to this one man that the Lord had chosen in that period to take Israel to the next level. Okay? But to think that when God thinks cities, he thinks of a man. When God thinks nations, he thinks of a man. When God thinks continents, he thinks of a man. When God thinks the world, he thinks of a man. Because it cannot be complete until it sits in the heart of that man. Until it sits in the heart of that man. All right? And this is what is happening. We see David conceive it in his heart, he tells the prophet Nathan, he says, see, I sleep or live in a house of cedar, you know, but the covenant is in curtains. It disturbed him, okay? And the prophet has to tell him, you know, go and do according to your heart. Nathan spoke as a prophet. In this instance, for example, when Nathan tells him, go and do as according to to your heart for the Lord is with thee. David, of course, carried it as a prophetic word and instruction from the prophet. But was it from God? No, it wasn't from God because not everything men of God say is from God. Okay? Not everything men of God say is from God. It's not that they are in any way intending to mislead or misguide, but it is because sometimes our emotions can be stirred in things that seem so rightful that we forget the higher law, the higher calling of God's judgment. And that is why later God comes to Nathan at night, all right, in a vision and tells him, hey, Nathan, I think you lost it here. This fellow is not the one supposed to do that. In the fourth verse, the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, that go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, thou will you build me a house to dwell in? Well, and have I not dwelt in any house since the time I brought up that, 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 that. he continues to explain that. But later on, God reveals to him, no, it shall not be for you, okay? It shall be for your son. It shall be through your own seed, okay, for you to build that. But if Nathan was not connected to the Spirit of God to understand what God really was saying, or if Nathan had held his silence, David would have gone ahead to do something that was not in line with the will of God, even though it was good in his heart to be that God was not against the building of the temple. But there was a bigger picture, all right? That is why later we see that God firstly builds a city through David, and it's in that city that Solomon builds the temple because the building of the city precedes the building of the temple, and that's another revelation as well. Some of you want very big cathedrals in communities that you have not changed and touched. You want big ministries in societies that you have not changed and touched. You want big churches of cities 
with whom you have not had authority over, okay? I'm talking about authority over. Some ministers or believers are simply surviving in the scheme of things in nations and generations, but there are people who are principalities, all right, in cities. They have authorities over, you know, many lands and spaces and places in the spirit realm. God firstly gives you the city, and in that city you build what you feel in your heart led by God to do. God does not break the order, and that is why he comes in to interject with Nathan's original prophetic instruction to David to build the temple. He's telling him, ah, oh, there's a bigger picture to this. I must achieve the bigger picture before we get into the smaller detailed one picture, okay? And this was God's picture, that the city be built before that temple is built. This is not only applicable to men of God or preachers. This is applicable to business people, all right? Have you been wired in frequency by the Spirit to have authority over the city you want to build that business into, okay? Over the city you want to establish that school into, over the city you want to build that university into, over the city you want to, you know, run that factory or company into, that huge consultancy into. Again, if you are serious about being the head and not the tail above and not beneath, because God has ordained us to be first in all things. And that is why we are challenged with Christians who have failed to get it to the top. Or the idea of going to the top is a disturbing thing sometimes because those who are on the top, they're not as connected to God as deep. You know, back in the day, there was a conversation, you know, where people used to say, oh, you know, we just need Christians to be on top of these mountains. And I don't know how believers have taught and misunderstood some of these aspects, the whole revelation of seven mountains, although if you go in scripture and read exactly where they get that definition of the seven mountain sphere of influence, where they get it from, you'll be amazed whether it was really the will of God or somebody simply just got a context and fit it where they thought they wanted. And I'm not saying that God is against us being fast and being on top of these mountains, but God is so concerned about the distinction of the person on top. He's so concerned about the quality of the Christian on top of this mountain. He's so concerned about the depth, you know, the relationship, the connection this Christian has on top of the mountain, okay? It's not just enough to say, oh, the leading person in media in our nation is a Christian, yes, but how much connected are they to God? How much can they teach? How much principle and pattern can they relate to the average believer? Because we've seen Christians who are on top of many things, but they're not an example. If anything, they would be swayed and mislead many. And that is my prayer, that when we say, oh, we need people up there on the mountain, our prayer should be we need a certain quality of Christians on that mountain. I think that makes sense, because if they're not going to enforce the kingdom of God, what are they doing up that mountain? All right? But back to what I was saying, God's idea all right, was that he would put it in the heart of this man, which was okay, which was good, and in the heart of this man then, God's vision is built, all right? You must learn, you must exercise yourself to know how to take over cities spiritually, how to take over nations spiritually. You've heard of the story of Cain and Abel. God told Cain, after killing his brother Abel, he tells him, For the land, the ground, shall not yield forth its substance or fruit to you. It shall not yield forth her strength to you, for you shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. The earth had to yield strength. It had to yield fruit and substance to Cain for him to be a success, for him to survive and be established. Without that, he is nothing. Okay? And so when we start now having conversations of how to take over cities, how to take over nations, how to take over continents, all right? Because if your sphere of influence, you know, cannot touch a city, then why would you think that you can build certain things in that city? If your sphere of influence cannot touch the nation, how do you think then you can build certain things in that nation? If your sphere of influence cannot touch continents, how do you think that you're going to have effect on the continent? The Bible says, the name of Jesus Christ was voiced abroad. It was voiced abroad. When your name, when your influence is voiced abroad, you enter certain spaces with a certain authority. Okay? That is why the Bible says that when he went to some of these cities where his names had gone ahead, they automatically brought the sick. 
You understand? The things that touch your purpose, your assignment and mandate are invited. They are attracted. They collect themselves toward you. You don't even need to go to them. When you, you know, are in a certain place in the spirit, okay, the things that touch your assignment, your calling, if you're a business person, for example, and you've learned how to exercise yourself above this territory spiritually, it means, for example, if you fly out of one nation and go into another nation, all right, and you are over and above the atmosphere of that nation, the frequency and waves of that nation, it means every opportunity of business is open to you. It will meet you at the airport. You'll meet somebody on the flight who will connect you to your next deal. You will get into meetings and meet people. Even if you go to a restaurant just to have yourself a cup of tea, if you are above certain spaces in the spirit realm, you can enter a restaurant and just meet the person, that particular person who will connect you to your next business deal. Because in the spirit realm, you own a certain space. There's a certain light out of you, and that light creates opportunity. That light creates opportunities more than you're even able at that particular point to furnish. Not because you cannot with your abilities and wealth, but because there are many more bigger opportunities than those that are of the hour. When the name of Jesus Christ was voiced abroad of him, the Bible says great multitudes came together to hear him and be healed by him of their infirmities. Luke 5.15, great multitudes came. This is not Jesus saying, oh, I pray people come to pray with me. I pray people come in my meetings, Lord, give me grace so people can know. He was so activated and on fire in the spirit that in every state he went, he had influence over territories. That power to influence territories, that in every nation you step, you're not accepted as a common man. No, you are accepted as a superior one. You are respected and honored. You are invited as something special to that nation. They see your purpose. They see your hand and the advantage of your gift. They see that your mandate is a saving of life. So when Jesus enters these places, he doesn't need to even announce that I'm coming. No, when they hear, the Bible says, great multitudes come together, the Bible says, to hear and to be healed of their infirmities. And I thank God in that order. I thank that when Luke is writing, he seeks to write things in order that he might, you know, bring a certain sanity of the order of the Spirit. You see, they come, one, to hear, two, and to be healed. You see, they don't just come to be healed, but firstly, they come to hear and to be healed. That's the only way we'll have the certainty of the things in which we have been established, Luke said. We can only be established in that certainty when we understand the order of the Spirit. In fact, when you go to church, when you congregate in fellowship, you congregate firstly to hear, okay? You congregate firstly to hear and then be healed. Firstly to hear and then be delivered. Firstly to hear and then be transformed or have your breakthrough. And that's why I tell people, firstly to hear. And I feel sorry for people who get to places where they cannot hear anything. And not because they don't want to hear, but the substance that is given to them is not worth hearing. It's not able to give them the breakthrough, the healing, and the deliverance. All right, because this hearing, you know, sets our pace of faith and connects us to the authority under which the man speaks. Okay, so God wants to establish David to a certain realm in the spirit. And when he's established in a certain realm in the spirit, the temple becomes a smaller one, order of establishment, because the city is built by the same man. Okay, and if you recall in scripture, when Solomon gets to the place, of building this temple, and he realizes that this temple is outside the city his father built, he extends the boundaries of that city to cover that temple because he knows that the safety of the temple is in the walls of the city, it's in the fortifications of the city. And when it comes to that, I could even go deeper, okay? When the Bible speaks of walls, fences, hedges, he's talking about revival, he's talking about reformation. Walls and fences are reformation in the spirit. When the Bible says in Ezekiel, I believe, 22, verses 30, he said, and I sought for a man among them, he said, that should make up the hedge. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, all right, and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found man. Again here, he sought for a man. He did not say, I sought for just the buildings. I sought for the fortification of these cities only. He said, I sought 
for a man that should make up a hedge. If I have to take you back in that story, in the days of Ezekiel, as he's prophesying, men had walked off God. They had disconnected from God, and all kinds of evil was slated in that dispensation. The sacred things were abused, and men were disconnected, and the sin of man had come up toward God, and judgment was coming toward them. God was made up to destroy them. And he said, but I wish I can just find a man to stand in the gap of these people. But when he's looking for a man to stand up in the gap of these people, he's saying, this man should be able to make up a hedge. What do I mean? He's giving a picture spiritually where the sinful nation, you know, the evil people who have given into darkness, okay, have broken walls of them. They're no longer hedged in, all right? They're no longer under any protection spiritually. So sin comes in as it can. You know, demonic activity comes in as it can. Witchcraft and mayhem come in as they can. Mischief and wickedness are of the hour and they're coming in as they can. Spiritually, God says, the only way to keep these people, all right, from sin, you can see when it talks about hedges or fences or walls, Okay, it means that the things that attacked Israel were from without, they were not from within. Every evil act that Israel had was not from within, it was from without. All manner of witchcraft and demonic worship go through such history that was in Israel was not founded by the men and people of Israel. It was always something that was imported from without. If you recall when Moses is bringing the children of Israel from Egypt, the Bible says, with them crossed mixed multitudes, all right? And these are the multitudes that star the children of Israel, all right, to rebel against Moses. If you read through history, you realize that the mixed multitudes are the people that help the children of Israel and inspire them into building molten images. It's always the things that the children of Israel imported in. It wasn't always with Israel because the root of Israel was a holy root. The history of Israel was connected to God. If you remember Solomon and how he splits up Israel, you realize that the problem was strange women. And many of these strange women that came into the lights of Solomon were from strange kingdoms and tribes. Okay? And that is why he was always very protective of the children of Israel to be so hedged within. Okay? If you understand that kind of picture, and then you shift into the New Testament and understand that we are new Israel, right? Usually you'll see that when we are born again, we are born of an incorruptible seed which leadeth and abideth forever. The things that corrupt us are things from without. You understand what I'm saying? They're things from without. If we let them in our hearts, if we allow the deceptions, the darkness of the world to enter our hearts, all right? And out of our hearts, then defilement begins. It's not necessarily that we are defiled because the world outside is defiled, but we are defiled because we let the things outside the world to come into our lives, and then those are the things that defile us. But originally, when you become born again, you're born of an incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, it liveth and abideth forever. You are perfect in God from your moment of salvation. Anything that frustrates, anything that misleads, anything that disconnects anything that takes you off the path and way of the spirit, usually you realize will be an influence of the world outside you, not the man within you, because the man within you is born of God. He's a new creation. That is why your deliverance, again, is from within. It's not from without. It's from within. Of course, the Bible says nothing without entering a man defileth him, because it entereth not into his heart. Okay? But if it entereth into the man's heart, if it entereth into the man's heart, if it entereth into the man's heart, then it will defile him. That is why it says, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. All right? What do you watch? What do you read? What do you hear? Where do you transact? What are the kinds of friends you keep? And for those of you who are still alive within, I believe every other day we wake up to the shock of how much the world is starting to influence the church. Many of our worships are secular. Many of our praises are secular. Many of our ways of 
ministry are like CEOs presenting board papers. They don't have the spirit with them. They are committing to capture the minds of men but not translate and change the heart. And I can't help for those of you who, you know, read the news. Now, it's almost as though the world is so fixated in fake news and hoaxes and plagiarists and all kinds of deception that we no longer even know what to believe. And for me, the sad part is not the deception and the fake news. No. For me, the sadness is in the fact that people no longer even care to be deceived or to know the truth. People no longer care to know the truth. Everything that comes on television for them is true. Everything that runs on social media for them is true. They don't even care. They don't go back to say, Holy Spirit, is this you? Is this true? They don't care. Many of those spaces in the conscience have been, you know, burnt to a certain place. And that is why we need to preach the gospel like never before. It's the only answer. It's the only solution. But back to what I'm saying. When he speaks in Ezekiel 22, he says, I looked for a man to build a hedge. See the responsibility. Revivals hedge people in. They build walls spiritually to protect men. All right? Reformation protect men. Revivals and reformation, these are for the protection of people. It's more than just the 10 million, the 20 million that are transformed in that move or reformed in that generation. It's not just about the hundreds of people that receive their lives in the first grade and the second grade awakening, Azusa, Four Square, the charismatic movement. No, it's more than just that. It's what happens in the spirit realm that these men, the pioneers of these movements, were actually in the spirit realm building hedges around God's people. They were building walls around God's people. They were underguiding God's people through intercession and the ministration of the word. It's not just in the word, it's also in the ministration. You cannot have a successful move of revival or reformation if you're not a praying person. It's not possible. And the results men who don't pray cannot have in the spirit. Don't be deceived. The results, men who don't know how to connect to God cannot have in the spirit. They cannot have. They can not have. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So when you study reformation, the spirit, revival and reformation, I believe not just in the revival because revivals have been cut short and have failed to be duplicated because they carry no end of reformation. The outer ring is reformation. So I believe in the holisticness of a move when it comes with the reformation in the revival, all right? Revivals and reformations, when you study that in the place and responsibilities of the man which is hedging in, it means that there is no move or reformation dispensation that carries no boundaries in the spirit. Because how can you hedge or build a wall without a definitive boundary of where that wall goes? That's for the mature you know, to search out. And these, in turn, define your realm of influence, all right? I'm not just talking about the physical present boundaries. Some people have learned the art by the spirit, okay, to have boundaries that even go beyond their existence in time, their physical existence in time. And that is why we read David now and is relevant. We read Paul now and is relevant. We read Ezekiel now and is relevant. You know, we read Mark, Luke, and John and is relevant, and there's many men that wrote, there's many men that spoke, there's many prophets that existed, but those had something on their lives that was relevant to be kept, to even instruct the next generation. Those are so deep things. I have learned, God has showed me both the boundary, physical, you know, how to expound your boundaries in the spirit realm, so you'll touch it, and you will see, you will see. Give one, two, three, four years, you'll see where Fanera as a ministry will be. We are a global influence. We're global influence. You cannot write history in East Africa and we're not written about. And it's going to go like that. It's going to go through Africa. It's going to go through the world until all the corners of the world know that God has called the people in this nation. But more than that, we are looking beyond that. Okay? I have seen the place where one day I'm long gone. If Christ is not yet back, whether it's two, three hundred years, people will dig out our materials. They'll play our videos. They will play our radio programs. They will read our books. They will quote us because the things that we're speaking will be relevant even in the years to come to the glory of God. I pray 
somebody understands that. But you see, this is more than just the altar. You can do that in a business. You can build businesses that will influence generations. Okay, you can build careers that can influence generations in assignment and purpose lines. You can build, you know, institutions that can influence generations upon generations upon generations. It's all in the power of vision for as far as your eyes have seen, I have given you. All right. So that is why when Solomon gets to the point of building this temple, he realizes, oh, the temple is not hedged in. What does it do? He extends the city of David to cover where the temple was built because the temple must be hedged in. It's a territory spiritually. It's owned spiritually. It doesn't mean that they were not above Israel, all right? But certain territories are guarded more than other territories, even if all those territories are under the individual. God has to give you the wisdom to know how to do that. But I also want to emphasize this, that when we open Chronicles, it's not quite only what God says, to David that your son after you, your son after you, he says, shall build a temple. It's more than just the son. It's more than just the son. All right? And if you will open in First Chronicles chapter 17, I love the rendering if you read in the KJV. First Chronicles 17 verses 11. And it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou shalt go to be with thy fathers. Now, this is a narrative to David. And I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I'll establish his kingdom. I love that in Chronicles, he mentions two words, seed and sons, all right? I shall raise up of thy seed, I shall raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I'll establish his kingdom. Of course, in Luke 8, 11, the part of Lee that the seed is the word of God. God is saying that through this man's heart, I will establish a particular seed in the sons. All right? I'll establish a particular message in the sons. And that particular message shall build a temple. And what is the message on Solomon? The message of Solomon is wisdom. The message, the seed, the message in Solomon is wisdom. It's what he asks for, an understanding heart, okay? And it's that wisdom through which God builds the temple. I wish some people understand this. It's more than just God saying that I will build this. No, it's I have this end picture. God says I have this end picture of prospering my people, building generations and things that are beautiful, magnificent of all. But my idea is a man, and in that man a particular heart. And in that heart, David, a man after God's own heart, in that heart, a particular wisdom, and in that wisdom, the ability to build a place of worship, my presence, my glory, my anointing. And when my anointing, my presence gets into that city, gets into that zone, it's hedged in by a man's wisdom, then prosperity will come. Everything else follows after. That's God's idea. David says in First Chronicles later in 22, verses 7, okay, now this is in David's words, all right? He says, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house and to the name of the Lord. But the word of God came to me saying, thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars, and thou shalt not build a house unto my name, he said because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. And behold, a son, eh, this is David now speaking, this is David speaking, shall be born of thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all the enemies round about him, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give him peace and quietness and to Israel in his day. Right? I'll give peace and quietness unto Israel in his day. Now, this is interesting, all right? The name David means beloved, all right? The man after God's own heart was hemmed in the revelation of the beloved one, okay? And the name Solomon means peace. So when he tells him that he shall be a man of peace, he shall be a man of peace, and he shall have rest of his enemies, all right? And I shall give peace and quietness unto Israel 
the peace and quietness of Israel is in the naming of Solomon, the man of wisdom which shall come after David. I don't know whether somebody is following. The man of wisdom which shall come after David. And that is Solomon. And what am I trying to tell you here? God is telling us, one, that destinies are ordained in the naming of things, okay? The things of the Spirit are named for God to complete the cycle of destinies. And we see the beloved one begetting a man of peace, all right? And we see that the man of peace has a message of wisdom. Are you seeing? The man of peace has a message of wisdom. The seed in the man of peace is wisdom. All right? And that is why the Bible says later in James that the wisdom from above is firstly pure. And what? And peaceable. All right? And peaceable. Peaceable. The wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. When a man has a wisdom of God, a certain wisdom of God, that man is peaceable. He's a man of peace. When you see Christians who like stirring up wars, who are vengeful and uh, want to revenge and fight and accuse and badmouth the brethren and fight for spaces and backbite others who are not peaceable, they don't have peace you know, around them or even in their own ministries, those are men who have not connected fully to the wisdom which is in Christ. Destinies are aligned and drawn in the naming of things. So it's no coincidence that he calls him Solomon, peace, because God spoke to him that a man of peace will build this. You have too much war on you. Even though you're beloved, you are avenging for Israel and you're fighting with the right heart, but there's too much blood with you. I can't build temples. I can't finish this without a certain peace. But this peace is in the message of wisdom. Wisdom. From above, he says it's peaceable. All right? So even though it's in the naming of Solomon, right? But the completion of that is the prearranged order of God for wisdom over this young man. This wisdom that God had planned to seek in the heart of the king. It's that wisdom that carries that peace. It's that wisdom that manifests that peace. It's that wisdom that undergirds that peace. So Solomon is named Solomon. All right? But he's not king at that point of naming. He becomes king later. And when he becomes king later, the older one, you know, the ancient one, wisdom, was waiting for him to tell him, look, I have walked with you all these days from the day I sat in the heart of your father when he began to think to build me a temple. And it's the thing that he told you when you were young. He says, for as my father's son, beloved in my mother's sight, and he taught me, to love and seek after wisdom. He spoke these words to you since you were little because I, wisdom, the ancient one, is under guarding you, all right, to be a man of peace as you are named in that peace. And this is the peace that builds the temple. If you have been following this teaching from the beginning, I just gave you an answer. I gave you a very strong key. May God give you wisdom to design this. Father, we thank you. We thank you. Because we are rested. We are men of rest. We don't fight for places. We don't compete for places. We don't strive with men. Because we carry a wisdom. And that's the wisdom that builds temples. The wisdom that builds ministries, conglomerates, institutions, empires to the glorification of your name. But this does not begin with these empires. Your idea does not begin with the empires. It doesn't begin with this greatness that men see. It begins with the man you choose. We were your idea. We were your idea. We were your idea. Right now in this moment and time, God is looking for available men and women for what must be done. And I pray that you'll make an honest prayer. I dare you. Tell God, I am available. I am available. There's somebody who's saying it right now. And the doctor has told you you have a few days to leave. And one day you'll testify that that was the time you were healed totally because God's agenda became bigger than the doctor's reports. Things are going to start changing in your life. 
because you are of use and purpose to this generation. The land will yield its strength to you. Nations will call you. Generations will respond to you. People will heed to you. The things that touch your assignment, your calling and purpose are running to you right now and in every space and place you will go to the glory of his name and expansion of his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray for the sick in your body. Be healed right now in the name of Jesus. I pray for marriages to be restored and strengthened. I pray for sons and daughters and children to be established in the name of Jesus. I pray for the sons and daughters of this ministry. May God give you a distinction. May God pour something so special upon your life for the hour. The bigger picture is there in the name of Jesus. I pray for the pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists, even of different ministries who are called in this hour, that may God shape these things and give a clarity of precision and purpose touching your ministry and life. I pray for your businesses. I pray for your careers. I pray for your education and everything that touches your lives, everyone, that all shall be well and it shall be aligned to the word God has sent today. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ and you're not born again, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Sometimes I ask myself, how can you live without Jesus? How can you live without Christ? How? It's not possible. In Him is life. In Him is light. So I want to give you an opportunity to receive the one who shed his blood for you, became the propitiation of your sins. He carried all of them that you might be free and have eternal life. So there, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for the word today. I give you my heart today. And I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior who shed his blood for me and was raised for my glory. I am born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.